For all it has done, Frankfurt officials admit that it may have trouble reaching its goal because of all its car commuters. Some 400,000 people commute to the city every day, most of them driving alone. Your car uses each day about 100 times its weight in ancient plants, and then it is so inefficiently used that only about 0.3% of the oil burned in your car actually moves you as the driver. The rest of it is wasted or moves the heavy steel car. The world uses about five cubic kilometers of oil every year, and most of that is for transport. Most of the transport energy is for cars. The next biggest for trucks, after that airplanes and other modes. So we use several cubic kilometers a year of oil to move vehicles around. But if we make cars out of ultralight ultra strong materials, then the car gets three times lighter, but safer. And then you can afford to electrify it because you need three times fewer of the costly batteries or fuel cells. So you end up with the car needing only one or two liters per hundred kilometers, or no liters at all because it's pure electric. A country like the United States uh, could, in, by 2050, run an even more mobile society using no oil, but a mixture of electricity, hydrogen, and advanced biofuels. Transportation is the single greatest reason for global warming. Technologists have developed several alternatives, but they all face challenges. In the United States, biofuel now runs large farming operations which produce more biofuel. Biofuels reduce the carbon in the atmosphere, but they are no match for oil. We've been burning biodiesel for almost 10 years. And I've basically just chosen to do that as a you know, supporter for the biodiesel industry, and it kind of uh, comes back to our industry. Probably the first eight or nine years, it probably cost me 30, 40 cents a gallon more. Um, just my last purchase this summer, it actually saved me probably 10 or 20 cents. Actually, maybe 20, 25 cents. And that's just uh, you know, a ratio of the value that the vegetable face, oil, uh, versus the petroleum, and those uh, ratios obviously fluctuate. It was a good thing to do. You know, we wanted to support renewable energy, we wanted to support our industry, we wanted to help mitigate our dependence on foreign oil. I think a very high percentage of the, the farms are now using biodiesel. Maybe not quite to the extent we are, but at the 10 to 20 percent range, I think it's become pretty widely adapted. I 
And back in the, the early days of oil, the net energy yield of drilling a vertical well was probably at least 100 to 1. So we invested a, a barrel of energy to net out 100 barrels of, of useful energy. Ethanol from corn is about 1.3 to 1. So we burn a barrel to net out three-tenths of a useful barrel of biofuels. Ethanol from sugarcane is a little better than ethanol from corn. Biodiesel made from soybeans or palm oil is certainly no more than two to one. But these are all very poor sources of, of petroleum liquids from a net energy point of view. For society, what that means is that we spend a lot more energy getting energy as opposed to having that energy do useful work for us. Iceland has easy access to free energy. And until recently, it was developing the perfect vehicle fuel, hydrogen. The beautiful thing about the Icelandic energy cycle is we have a lot of hydropower and geothermal power to make renewable electricity. Just put electricity into water and that separates water into oxygen and, and hydrogen. And the hydrogen molecule actually stores the electron. And then you pump the hydrogen into a vehicle and you go through the fuel cell process. But then you can see things dripping from the tailpipe and that's pure water. The advantage of hydrogen, you can store in a similar container size as a gasoline tank today, you can easily store about five kilos of hydrogen. And five kilos of hydrogen are gonna take you 500 kilometers. Then everybody said, it's all gonna be hydrogen. That's the solution. And hydrogen should be mass produced before 2010. Iceland's government decided to convert the country's transport system to hydrogen and built the infrastructure, but the revolution stalled. Car makers never did provide the cars. The car manufacturers expected the hydrogen to actually develop faster and the fuel cell would be ready faster. But it just took a longer time. We had also a recession in the auto industry, which I don't think sped research up. The economics of the station was really good. It was a good station, performed much better than we expected. So we actually realized by using it for, with only 30 cars, but if, you, if we would have 200 cars, we would actually be running this with a profit. And there's no profit in building infrastructure when you have no vehicles. That's going to be very costly in the beginning. And the question is, where is that money coming from? Is that coming from governments as a subsidy? Is it coming from industry? So we here in Iceland, this station, unfortunately, is obsolete because we started so early. So we have the early adopters disadvantage. Everywhere where there has been testing of battery electric vehicles or hydrogen vehicles or any of the new technologies, the public is in general very positive, but sometimes people don't put their money where their mouth is. But sometimes they do. Electric cars are ever more popular in North America, but the infrastructure is weak. Green entrepreneurs are trying to solve that problem. To uh, create a model to prove to the world that it can be done, we implemented the infrastructure across one of the largest countries in the world and one of the most geographic and climate diverse. You can travel coast to coast across Canada um, for free, so it, no charge at all as long as you're driving a green vehicle. Our host locations uh, that we partnered with across the country are providing the, the electricity for the vehicles. No banks, no provincial or federal governments. The money came from uh, selling off a lot of assets and borrowing from uh, my other company. It's been a long, uh, long uh, haul, I guess, of trying to figure out um, how to solve this issue. <laughs> This is a Tesla Roadster. This car is a little bit special because it's, uh, it's the car that drove over 10,000 kilometers last December in the middle of a Canadian winter. And uh, it did it 100% emission free and at no cost. 
It was uh, it was an incredible ride. We could have had this done a long time ago if we had enough people willing to move forward and, and actually make a difference. And I, I really think that was really the impediment. We didn't have the infrastructure, the cars aren't going to come. You know, if, if people can't travel distances, they're not going to buy an electric car. You know, it's no different than when people were riding horses. Why would you buy a car with no gas stations? We're really uh, repeating the same, uh, the same process that, that started around 100 years ago. You know, my three favorite words in all of this is beware of scale when you're talking about alternatives. 250 million motor vehicles in the U.S., and it's going to take a long time to, to switch them over. Rather than trying to keep up the level of personal mobility that, that people enjoy in North America, it's likely much better to make that investment in alternatives, you know, much better mass transit. And that infrastructure takes a long time to build. Amsterdam may have the best combination of mass transit and bicycle lanes in the world, but it was not always that way. Well, many people use the bike, and I think that especially in the center of town and the neighbors around it, more than 60% of all rides are done by bike. After the Second World War, the car became very popular. But for the car, you have to break down the complete city. We didn't want to do that. And there's been a lot of fight and struggle to, to stop cities to be broken down just for you know, making big roads for cars. And at the same time, there was an environmental movement of people who want to say, no, use the bike. It's, it's ecologically, it's healthy, and it's actually faster as well. So many people started to use the bike from the 70s on, and it's still growing now. We have a, a very dense network of cycling paths in every city. Well, one of the most important things is that they're trying to, to make the use of the car less. The policy is that you can reach every place by car, but it should not necessarily be along the fastest or the shortest route. So if you go from one point to another point in Amsterdam by car, you probably have to go a very awkward route to get there, and it's done deliberately. It's funny to, to know that uh, in Amsterdam, many young people, they don't bother about having a car. I mean, a car used to be a symbol of status. But today, people only want transportation. As we proceed through the 21st century, energy is going to get more expensive and we'll have less of it. Well, that shouldn't be the end of the world, you know? We, we have right now the most energy available to us that human beings have ever had in all of our history as a species. So ratcheting down from this pinnacle doesn't have to be the end of the world. It's just a matter of adjusting our expectations accordingly and using energy more efficiently. It really is not a, a question of, of how much we'll set aside. It's more a question of how much we'll have to let go along the way. And I don't know the answer to that question.